Hi, thank you for joining us today. Our company is Exalt's Digital Marketing Agency, and we're out here speaking the good word on digital PR. What's digital PR? It's digital public relations. It's making sure that when a consumer is ready to consume information about your business, whether you get your business into traditional media or other forms of media, you're spending heavy on traditional aspects, you want to make sure when somebody's ready to consume their own media on Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever it may be, that you all are going to be top of mind and that you're going to control the conversation. Make sure that you're getting out the message that you want your consumers to read. So this is the overview of what we're going to talk about. So what is digital PR? Who needs digital PR? Because a wide range of people within your organization need it from the individuals to the overall company and different initiatives that you're looking to push. Why do you need digital PR? So some statistics of how consumers are behaving and it, just businesses in general. And then some digital PR strategies to work into your strategic initiatives along the way. Some tactics to achieve it. And then reporting success. Because all the work we do in today's world, if we can't report success or if you have to sit into a board meeting or a meeting with your boss and they look at the Google search results and they ask you why something's still showing up in the top 10, you need to be able to report why that's happening and what you're going to do to essentially expunge that information or manipulate it so that the message that you want is being present at the top of the results. So what is digital PR? It's essentially controlling your brand message on the online presence when it's amongst the search results as well as your social media platforms. Depends on the type of business as to which social media platform you should be focusing on, but we'll get more into that as we go further into the presentation. So who needs digital PR? When you're looking at different individuals in your organization, whether it be your board, the company itself, or specific influencers within an organization that somebody might be researching, you have to make sure that they have a reflective digital presence. So if you have an executive who likes to get out there, is always in the media, and they have no coverage on the internet, that's something you must address. When you're looking at the overall company, whether you're just trying to get out your brand message or you're trying to hire additional people within the organization, and you might just happen to have a bad glass door sitting at the top of the results, or your company has to work with recruiting agencies because you all just can't recruit people directly, and it usually has something to do with what people might be seeing when they're actually doing their research on your organization. When it comes to other people that might benefit from digital PR, we work with various agencies on the traditional side. So it's great that they get stuff into the newspaper, but if you all walk your dog in the morning or just take a walk, you'll notice most print papers are essentially either going out of business or people just aren't opting in for the newspapers anymore. So you want to make sure, once again, that your information is there when people are consuming media at their point of consumption. And then emerging brands. So if you went out there and you received some capital or you have some investors out there and you just need to get a message out there about what you're actually doing, as an organization and a company, it's very important that you're flooding the Google results as well as your social media profiles with relevant topical information that's current and at the top of the consumer's mind. Now, when you're looking at why everyone essentially needs digital PR, digital media is consuming two-thirds of consumers' time when they're doing their research. So if you all were watching the Super Bowl, for example, goes to a commercial break, yeah, you want to watch commercials, but if the commercial loses your attention in the top three seconds, you're probably at your phone looking at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, whatever it may be, wherever your interest is, you're essentially deviating towards those digital platforms. I myself, whenever I'm watching TV, usually I'll do some like diligence on an advertiser if I see something that piques my interest, or if I see a topic and I want to know more about what's going on, I immediately go to social media. Me, myself, I'm a sports advocate, so if I'm watching a sports game and all of a sudden there's an injury, they go to commercial break, first place I go to is Twitter, I research the game, and I try to figure out what that actual injury is. Well, 94% of B2B buyers are essentially going to do some research before they make an online purchasing decision. And right now, 88% of consumers in some surveys actually trust online reviews more so than they trust word of mouth. If you also engage in Facebook or Instagram or you just see how people shop for travel or shop for various things, they'll usually go out, they'll ask a question on social media. Or if you're in the home service business and you haven't looked at Nextdoor, I would strongly encourage you to do so because if you're active in Nextdoor, you'll notice that's essentially becoming the Facebook for all home upgrades and everything that somebody might be doing. The reason I mention that vertical is it is one of the surviving 
Google vertical, as I call it right now, I'd say Google is in a fight for their life. So as we're talking about digital PR in general, we don't want you to think siloed. When you're thinking like just SEO, just social media, just paid search, you're essentially siloing all of your digital efforts. They should be combined, there should be convergence, and they should all be operating within a universe. And essentially, when you look at some of these statistics, Google continues to compile search queries at almost 40K per second. 91% of brands are on two social media platforms and 15% of searches are never seen before. For example, we all have the latest trend in health with like the coronavirus. Those would be new searches. Or you have the election coming up. Essentially, there's many new searches that are being created on an ongoing basis. You'll see the current president measure what's happening on social media and essentially parlay that over into what he's doing from a search perspective or essentially triggering consumers to actually search. And whether anybody dislikes who's in the White House or like has an opinion on it, nobody in this room can essentially say that he hasn't manipulated and gained social media to the ultimate fullest. If you look at Facebook ad transparency right now, you'll also see he's outspending essentially everybody in the other party by 10 to 20 times the amount. So essentially, when he's corresponding with his message, he's doing it very strategically. He's scientifically measuring all the responses, comments, and how people are engaging with different things in different geo, geo markets. You'll also see it when you watch the Super Bowl advertising, you would see some of the advertising that they put out as well. But I know po politics is definitely a sensitive topic, so I'll move on from that. But you all know that Obama won the election through Google and Trump won it through Facebook. So it just shows you where we are in today's world. Now, when you're looking at your playbook for success, it's important to have a responsive, contextually rich website. What that means is a well-structured website with siloed information that's very effective. We prefer WordPress as our CMS of choice. Essentially, Google knows that 60 to 70% of the market is on this platform. So they crawl it very efficiently, very effectively. If you use a tool like Built With, you can go out there and see what a website's on or the different cookies that are on it. Have active social media profiles. Once again, these are very dependent on the business. And then start to do ongoing high DA backlink authority. So high domain authority, make sure you're getting backlinks to assets that you want to manipulate to the top of the results. And then when it comes to microsites, we'll talk a little bit more about this. You can either do microsites or subdomains, but when you're looking at microsites, you wanna make sure that you have keywords that you wanna trigger in the search results within your domain names. Now, when you're looking at a responsive, contextually rich website, you should all be on Google Search Console and make sure that your website is integrated correctly with the Google bots and the Google engine. So some things that you wanna consider a branded website needs to meet Google's current development standards. So if your core website is lacking, that's something that you need to address. It's critical to make sure so you get effectively picked up in the search engine results. Some things that should be on your checklist are to have a responsive framework. So make sure that your website loads properly on all devices. We are right now in a mobile first world, but if you're in the B2B world or you're in a high purchase value decision, a lot of people will be checking that information on a laptop, desktop, tablet. So you wanna make sure all your information checks out on all devices and that you're covered. If you go into your Google Analytics as well, you can see where consumers are engaging most with your brand. Depending on the income levels that you're dealing with, you'll also see that they might be using a different cell phone. They could be on iPhones, they could be on Android. So you wanna make sure that checks out across all browsers. If you see a suspicious high bounce rate, or low page engagement, those are things that you'll want to troubleshoot. You can either do it through browser stack or some other simulators. There's something called Troy Labs if you do search out there to look at responsive frameworks. But essentially, if you really, if it's high value enough, you might actually want to get the device, hook it up to a Wi-Fi, and then see how your website's rendering. You want to make sure your website's easy to use and works on all devices. Using a mobile website as a desktop site, it's a big no-no. We see it in a lot of situations where somebody's treating the experiences as one, but you gotta understand the consumer's probably in a different mindset. If they're actually visiting your brand on a desktop or something that's more substantial than a mobile device, they're probably deeper down the buying funnel and you wanna make sure that user experience is great. You wanna make sure you have dedicated viewports, everything's working best, 
and on a desktop site, we strongly frown upon the hamburger navigation. So you want to make sure that's built out. Another thing that personally is a big peeve of mine is no, no templated horizontal navigation, which means if you have like home, about us, services, testimonials, contact us, like a lot of companies do out there, essentially I would say lose it. Look at your organization. What services do people buy from you? What are you looking at as a whole from a company? Where does that 80% of your revenue come from that represents 20% of who you are? Make sure that stuff is strongly, strongly communicated on the main navigation points. And I always say to somebody, when you go to the drive-thru at McDonald's, it's no secret what they want you to buy. You, they want you to buy a value meal, and they want you to upgrade it. So that's always forefront. Just think about that when you're looking at your navigation and what you want to highlight. Also, don't forget the footer navigation. You've been seeing that a lot. People forget that when somebody makes it to the bottom of the site, they might need to loop back in. Now, another thing to consider is making sure you're compatible on all mobile devices. Once again, digging into your analytics, making sure that you analyze the audiences, the technologies, and the browsers in specific OS, and then loading quickly on cellular data. So right now, Google has their page speed test, but we highly recommend utilizing GT metrics. It's gonna be a more thorough scoring opportunity. It's also gonna give you more troubleshooting opportunities as to how to fix up your website, make sure it loads correctly, and you should always know that when Google is grading your, your site speed right now, it's not on the most up-to-date network, so they are harshly scoring a lot of websites out there, but you do want to make sure you are scoring high, because at the end of the day, it's purely a bot, and there's a lot of AI into how they're setting their ranking results. So the checklist, once again, when you're looking at the responsive website design, make sure you have a responsive framework that's going to scale appropriately on all screen devices, that's easy to use and interact from a mobile to a tablet and a desktop. I would tell you mainly to focus on your mobile and your desktop sites. And then compatibility with all mobile browsers and that's loading quickly on all cellular devices. And once again, you can use the Google Page Speed Insight or GT Metrics. So your playbook for success is also gonna include comprehensive on-site optimization. So yes, yeah, some simple blocking and tackling on SEO by following these SEO best practices, your website's gonna have the best chance to rank. So what do you need to do for an optimized website? You gotta start with, <clears throat> start with your keyword research. If you're on Google Ads, I'd strongly recommend you look at your impression counts within the Google Ads platform. That's gonna be your best data. But then there's also a bunch of keyword tools that you can go out to. So you're gonna to wanna to start with that keyword research, the data that will guide you to the best keywords that you're gonna build your metadata around as well as your content development, your page structure, and the blog topics that you might engage with. Now when you're looking at also other suggested points for content on your website, when you're looking to rank for a specific keyword, you wanna to go to the Google search bar, type it in, and then hit space bar, and see what Google auto suggests as potential results. And I'd also strongly encourage you to look at the related searches at the bottom of the page. Now when you're looking at the related searches at the bottom of the page, it's gonna be scored one through four to the left, and then five through eight on the right. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have topics that essentially concur with all that information that Google is finding relevant for your specific keyword. Now, when you're looking at optimizing metadata, you gotta identify the key pages, restate it, the main idea, and then avoid duplicate content. So avoid a few lines as copy up and above, and then over-optimization is something that we dis discourage, and you wanna keep it simple. Now, schematic markup is essentially the new metadata. If you're not partaking in schema, you definitely need to. So you have to go check out schema.org, look into your specific industry and vertical, and make sure that your different areas of categories and topics and content on your website, if they can be organized within the schema.org platform, you wanna make sure that you're hitting and adhering to all the content that they're looking for. This is the newest form of rich data markup, and as the bots are continuing to answer people on the mobile devices, and you're looking for that zero search result that everybody's talking about, it's essentially gonna come from the schema markup. So schema.org is really one of the main projects that Google, Yahoo, Bing all essentially kind of worked on together. It's essentially the only project they ever worked on together. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're adhering to everything on that site. The site looks a little dated, but it's definitely relevant in today's world. And then Google also has a structured data tool that you can plug in your actual website and make sure that it checks out from a schema perspective. 
when you're looking at technical audit, audits, we recommend specific tools. There's Web CEO. We also like Screaming Frog. But the user experience is going to matter. You're going to want to make sure that there's really no 404s. You're going to want to measure that on your website. And also, if you're redirecting pages, make sure you're doing 301 redirects. Broken links will definitely impact your search results. And as a whole, you just want to always be paying attention to the specific content that people are looking at. And there's a strong migration right now into evergreen content, which is updating specific pages of more relevant topics. And then also cutting out the pages on your site, which may be dated or essentially site bloat. So you don't want your site to have essentially too many pages at this point because Google has what's called a crawl budget and they're trying to make it as efficient as possible. So if you have pages that are outdated or essentially a blog that talks about things that happened in 2015, you're gonna to wanna to make sure all that information is updated and redirects to the initial points that you want them to. Cash cleanup, so fixing your cash flow. One of my favorite things to do is do site colon command of an actual website within the Google search results. It'll show you the order as to how Google is prioritizing the pages on your website. When we're analyzing specific folders for a client that they wanna make more relevant, we take the site colon command, we look at the folder and see how many pages are actually within that folder. So when you're organizing the website, the best analogy I can give you is look at it like an encyclopedia, if you can recall what those were. There's a whole set of books, there's an index, you would look at specific chapters, and that, well, with a book, then you look at specific chapters supported by pages, and you wanna make sure all the pages within that chapter support what you're trying to rank towards or what you're trying to drive information towards. When you look at a website structure, this once again looks at the specific folders, have your core services as a main list level. Like I said, strong advocate of making sure that information that drives your revenue, drives your business, is essentially coming off your dot-com route, and then you essentially have folders that support all that information. Make sure your related topics are grouped within one another. So if you have specific topics on your page or specific categories within your organization, make sure that you have specific silos where all the services or solutions are essentially within a folder that are supported by a number of pages. Once again, you'll want to do that site colon command and be able to see what your infrastructure looks like on your website. So if you have a 100 page website, hypothetically, five service areas, you want to, want to make sure that you have specific pages that are bucketed into your most specific services that you want to rank for and that you're ranking highest for them. So here's a checklist of the different areas for comprehensive on-site optimization. Once again, keyword research, optimized metadata, the schematic markup, which I can't tell you enough of, is very important in today's market, doing technical audits using a tool like Screaming Frog or Web CEO, the cache cleanup, realizing that Google does have a crawl budget and has inventory as to how many pages they actually want to read on your website, and then also looking at your website structure. If you want to download a checklist of some information, you can find it at digitalpr.com slash smxwest. So your playbook for success is also going to include active social media profiles. When you're looking at different social media profiles, it enables you to communicate your brand effectively as possible. Each social media account, not claimed or managed, is going to hurt your reputation. So we'll find that organizations might not claim everything across Instagram, across Twitter, across Facebook, LinkedIn. You're going to want to make sure they all synergize. And as there's something that's trending in the social media world, you'll want to claim those handles and make sure all the information is unified and cohesive with the brand message you want to get out there. So your checklist should include profiles set up on all major platforms relevant to your industry. So you're going to want to identify the social media platform that's most relevant to you as an organization. Then you're also going to want to get links and content for, from Facebook or LinkedIn. And then images, you're going to want to look at trying Instagram or Pinterest. Pinterest ranks really well in Google Images and is a very relevant place if, you're, if your uh, business is very image driven. So we have clients that might have a business that does something for interiors, or essentially even if you're in the real estate business or different areas where somebody's gonna be looking for pictures, I've made some serious travel decisions based on what I'll find on Pinterest. Uh, and they also say that Pinterest is the highest value purchase from any social media platform. Because if you look at the buying decisions that people are making off Pinterest, they're gonna be pretty high up there. If you look at the buying decision that somebody's making off Instagram, 
maybe they're buying a pair of shoes or a pair of glasses. Whereas on Pinterest, somebody might be buying flowers for a wedding, or they might be planning an entire trip where they're spending five to 15,000, or essentially back to Facebook and Instagram, those are gonna be low purchase value decisions from a social platform. So when we're talking about active social media platforms, accurate company information on all profiles. You'd be surprised how many companies might not be taking the opportunity to update all the descriptions and information as effectively as possible. And if Facebook has its way, there will be no www at some point. So you always want to make sure that you're always updating all that Facebook information. Essentially, Facebook was pitched as the operating system as the internet of the internet, and that's why Microsoft got so involved with them early on. So as long as Facebook continues to get a lot of traffic, and it will continue to in the future, you want to make sure all your information is updated there as well. Each social media profile is going to count high from a high quality relevant backlink to your domain name, whether it's tracked or not. And then you want to be able to look at your name, address, phone number consistency. There's a lot of tools out there like Moz Local, Gex, that you can look at to essentially make sure that all of your local listings are accurate and formatted consistently. Make sure your cover images fit properly on mobile devices. So something that might look right on your desktop, on Facebook, essentially load it on your mobile device and double check that it's loading properly there. So active social media profiles, curating the feed with interesting and engaging content. Once again, you can measure how people are responding. Customers are choosing to follow you on social media, so make it worth their time. Make sure they're seeing valuable content and think that things that they're gonna engage with and don't always make it self-promotional. Remember to have fun and be engaging with social media. That's what people are there for, and that's what they're there to do, is engage with information, and essentially the goal is if you can get them to share content. Respond to messages and comments. Don't let your social media go unmanaged. Whether it's good, bad, ugly, you wanna to respond to it. Because if you don't respond to it, you just leave it in the consumer's hands, you don't control the conversation, and there's nothing that's gonna upset somebody more than not being heard when they're trying to reach out to you on social media. We've had a number of clients that have been able to actually respond to something proactively within a social media platform and been able to talk to the consumer and essentially get them to either remove or edit their comments. So once again, you wanna engage them directly. And don't let that stop you from engaging, like I said, that you wanna make sure that all the information that you can like just Tell somebody they're being heard because you can get those negative comments to change in a lot of ways. So the checklist for active social media profiles, once again, you wanna set them up on all the major platforms relevant to your industry. We usually tell somebody to like hero a specific platform. Usually we'll do like Facebook first or Instagram first and then you can share and syndicate information to other profiles. You wanna have accurate company information within all your profiles and then curate a feed with interesting, engaging content because you want it to be engaging and then respond to messages and comments. Once again, don't let the consumer go unheard. Looking at ongoing high DA backlink building. So Google's always out there saying backlinks are bad or you know whatever it may be. A number of tests and a number of things that we've done for clients show that backlinks actually do work. The reason I say that Google Webmasters essentially tell you don't do backlinks is they really can't control what's being published out there and they can't control how everything's being indexed but if they find it, they might penalize it. But backlinks are essentially a cornerstone of an organic SEO program. So you could be doing everything effectively on site, but if you're not out there curating links or getting links from people outside your network, essentially your website's gonna fall flat. The, if you look at the core elements of how Google was established, it was all based on backlinks and essentially how many votes websites were getting. They help boost the results of a digital PR campaign and various assets. So if you have an asset that you want consumers to see that might be sitting on the second, third, fourth, fifth page, deep down in the results, you can essentially manipulate that information by pointing different links towards it or making sure that it's being heard more effectively. And not all backlinks are essentially gonna be created equal. So we do recommend digital press releases. So you'll notice a lot of press releases right now, they do have a limited shelf but at the same time, a well-written, timely, and topical press release is gonna to start to create you a lot of backlinks. We've even had clients that'll get picked up in the Wall Street Journal or other major publications as a result of something that we might syndicate on the Vocus, Sision, 
uh, PR Newswire releases, EIN, because essentially a lot of the writing houses at the traditional media companies are basically skeleton shops right now. So they'll go out there, they'll do their Google searches, they'll look for information, they'll have their Google Alerts set up, and these press releases will hit those areas. So don't miss out on the easy wins. There's a lot of opportunities to create press releases, whether you're expanding your organization, starting to accelerate a specific service within your organization, or even if you're acquiring other companies, if you're hiring, these are all reasons to do different press releases. You wanna focus on growth, development, or timely content, as there are a lot of triggers that are set up at some of these websites that are actually gonna pick and choose what content somebody's gonna put at the top of their website. The backlink acquisition, so not all backlinks are gonna be created equal. If you've had experience with this, if you've gone out there to a number of vendors, you'll essentially be able to compile lists of opportunities for backlinks. So each backlink you acquire is like a vote back to your website. We recommend that you diversify your link profile and that you're consistently getting them. Now, some tests that you could easily do to kind of filter through a number of domain backlink opportunities is check that the website's actually meeting Google standards. So if they don't have an HTTPS on their site, essentially I throw that site out. If the website's not responsibly built, I throw that site out as well. That will trim out probably 30 to 40% of opportunities that you might have for backlinks. And essentially focus on the people that are meeting the standards like you all probably are. So ongoing backlink building, have a natural acquisition schedule. When you're publishing high quality content, backlinks accumulate over time. But focus on acquiring at a minimum one to two domain authority backlinks a month and then essentially some organizations or some companies, if you have a specific, uh, I'd say regiment that you've been doing for a number of years, you can begin to ramp that up and you can escalate that pretty fast. And then strategy, like I said, is gonna depend on the strength and authority that you've already created. So some properties that like we've managed, essentially they could be up to 10, 20, or even more backlinks. It's not a race, so choose wisely and focus on the quality. We've also been seeing that the search results for local businesses have been manipulated a lot by having high review counts. So that's something that you'll wanna make sure that you get as well. There's a number of tools you can use out there to send to your current customers or clients to actually push them into review platforms to assist with that. So some of the ongoing backlink building we recommend, once again, digital press releases. There's always gonna be an excuse to syndicate good news backlink acquisition on a regular regiment from a high domain authority sources, and then have a natural schedule. Once again, you don't want to be spamming the index. And then ongoing backlink building from these DA authorities, high domain authority once again. And then your playbook for success, looking at microsites with high value domains. So if your core website's already checked out or you have an IT department that's like, oh, you can't touch the main website or you've been waiting like three months to a year for a specific update, one thing that we would recommend is potentially doing some microsites. So this would be getting control of an actual environment and then to achieve a, high, a highly diverse search engine results page, it's gonna be important that you have more branded assets, controlled assets, and that you're dominating the front page for things that may impact your business. When you're looking at doing the research once again, as I back up through the presentation, I would say, go to Google, push space bar, see what's related, see what's actually showing up within the results right now, and start to pick on some of those brand terms to decide what you're gonna use. And so, when you're searching for your brand terms online, you're gonna check those related searches. We've seen situations where some of that might have bad words in it, like lawsuit, complaints, bad reviews. You're gonna wanna make sure you work all that stuff out because I'd say that that Google search space, space bar command is the most dynamic reflection of your organization. And then the related searches at the bottom of the, the results are gonna be the most concrete relationships that Google does have. The results should help make your domain selection. So we've worked with brands where we'd select brand names slash brand names careers.com, brand names reviews.com. Or once again, if it's a specific service, it could be your brand name a service.com. When you're looking at focusing on keywords with natural content potential, 
your new microsite will need content regularly. So you're gonna to wanna to be building this out. You're always gonna to wanna to be updating the content. Essentially, that does trick the algorithm to ranking the sites higher. And then select, select topics that'll have natural content opportunities. For example, we're very involved in the local community down where we're from, as well as, as a number of nonprofits. There's also a website out there called donorschoose.org that I love where you can always make micro donations to different local schools to assist in, in the school programs. And those are always great press release opportunities as well as content opportunities. Topics like careers, news, community involvement, coupons, those are also easy relationships to nurture and start to build up more effectively. Keep your microsites active and updated. Updating the content on an ongoing basis is always gonna be a big win. News, events, involvement, or career opportunities, once again, those are gonna be your core areas that we'd suggest to focus on. If your organization does stay involved in the community with nonprofits, that's always something to be a big advocate of. The NBA does a very good job of it. If you look at NBA Cares, and there's just a number of organi organizations out there that do control their reputations by making sure there's positive information always being published. So when you're looking at these microsites, once again, your checklist is gonna be think related searches. That's stuff at the top. Look at the related searches at the bottom. Focus on keyword opportunities with natural content potential and then keep your microsites active and updated. So pick content that you're gonna be able to manipulate, get a lot of fresh information out there, and always be updating on a regular basis. So your playbook for success is gonna start with a responsive, contextually rich website, comprehensive on-site optimization, don't forget schema, we see that overlooked a lot in today's marketplace. Have active social media profiles, make sure that you're representing a social media profile that correlates best with your business, ongoing domain link, authority building, and then microsites with high value domains. At this point, we're gonna to go to reporting success. So if you've cultivated a squeaky clean SERP for your brand, but don't know how to report it, here's a few tips on how to do that. You're gonna to wanna to look at the amount of owned assets on the first page of results. We also like to look at what's on the second and third page, but you'll wanna be paying attention to what's in those top 20 to top 30 positions. You're gonna to wanna to look at accurate results for your key terms, branded as well as non-branded, depending on how large your organization is, and then audit your search results from a VPN. There's a number of VPN networks out there, but we use private access network, and we always recommend that you do some, some test searches to make sure that you're showing for that specific area. When you're reporting success, you're gonna to wanna to look at the amount of owned assets on that front page, your brand's core website, as well as microsites and social profiles, you can make those show up higher in the results. Ancillary sites like directory websites, positive news, and, and concentration of specific websites that favor your organization, you're gonna wanna make sure those are showing up higher, and that's also gonna measure your success over time to make sure that you're manipulating your results correctly. Use specific rank tracking tools. WebCEO is a very effective one, and check it from various cities as well as locations to make sure that you're showing up. When you're reporting success, once again, don't count your clean SERP as just a win. If you're only monitoring branded terms, that's not always gonna be the answer. Ask yourself what consumers might be potentially searching related to your business, and then use the search query data from your high impression counts on Google Ads in particular. There's a lot of large organizations that use Google Ads for keyword research more than they use other tools, and we would definitely encourage that. Audit your search results looking at various VPNs. So once again, this is looking at other cities. If you wanna test and make sure you're showing that specific city, search pizza near me, everybody's favorite, and you'll be able to see that a pizza parlor is showing up, up toward the top of the results, and it'll show you that you're actually in that specific location. So the checklist, once again, for reporting your success is gonna be the amount of owned assets that you have on that first page of results that you can control accurate results for your key terms as well as non-branded, and then audit your results from different VPNs. Because what you might be seeing in one market might be completely different from what a consumer is gonna be seeing in another market. So to give you the overview, talked about what is digital PR, who's gonna need it, why you need digital PR, some strategies that you can implement literally tomorrow, and then reporting your success. If you have any questions, this is now the time.